Galatians chapter 4, the Lord has given me a very specific, sharp-edged word tonight. It is entitled, Put Your Toys Away. <laughs> that title is a double entendre. It means exactly what it says, but there's a deeper meaning that is veiled underneath that. And we're going to find out what the Spirit's going to say to us tonight. And I want to remind you as a disclaimer that Jesus was Savior. It's like the frosted mini wheat. One side's frosted, the other side's plain. The part of salvation is the frosted side. The plain side is the discipleship. He's not just Savior, He's Lord. I'm not just your pastor, I'm your leader. As your pastor, I'll comfort you when you're afflicted. As a leader, I will afflict you when you're comfortable. Tonight's one of those leadership. And God chose y'all to be here. I didn't call you. God called you. I'm just the one that he uses to poke you. Galatians 4, verse 1. Now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, say child, does not differ at all from a slave. Even though we're heirs, if we're a child, we do not differ at all from a slave. Though he is, come on, help me preach there, brother. Though he is master of all, but is under, say under, guardians and tutors or stewards until the time appointed by the Father. Even so we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world, but when the fullness of time had come, we're getting to that point, God sent his own son, born of a woman, born under law, to redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons, not children, as sons, mature. And because you are sons, God has sent forth His Spirit, the Spirit of His Son, into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Therefore you are no longer a slave, but a son, and if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. For years... I kid you not, I have wondered why people will work themselves to death trying to please someone who controls them, but when they're given the opportunity to be free from their control, they will rebel. Think about that. The Jews were made slaves and beaten like animals by the taskmasters of Egypt. But when God instructed them, to trust in him while in the wilderness, they rebelled against God and wanted, of all things, to return back to their abusers even though God had liberated them. Think about that, y'all. I said it Sunday morning before Dr. Tracy started preaching. I said, do you really want to be free? Not everybody that tastes freedom really wants what it requires to walk in that freedom. When the Jews came out and they realized, wait a minute, this is going to cost us something. I'm not willing to pay that price, so let's go back to those that beat us, those that control us. What kind of person would want that kind of abuse? Can I get a witness? And yet, Christians, God has liberated us. He has called us to be sons and daughters of God. But when God says it's time to put away your toys, we go away crying and we go back to the world because we don't want to experience the things that it cost us in order to walk in that freedom. And that freedom is where you're going to have to walk if you want to overcome this world and walk in the authority of God. Parents, have you noticed this about your children or your child? They will do anything for others that they ask of them and not have any problem doing that. But if you ask them to do the very same thing, they get angry at you. There's a spiritual reason why people had rather be controlled than to operate in love and be free by faith. Unbelief will choose control every time. But faith will choose freedom and independence. Do you want your independence? There was a lot of people that birthed this nation that wanted their independence from control. And they were willing to pay the price to obey God to become independent. That they may what? Serve God. Wasn't that the purpose? We want to worship God. We don't want man controlling us. So let me ask you this question. Do you want to walk by faith or do you want to be controlled by man? There is no third option. 
John 8, verse 29. Jesus is speaking to the Jews, and he says, And he, the Father, who sent me, is with me. The Father has not left me alone, and here's why. For I, I always say, always, do what? Those things that please him. As he spoke these words, many believed in him. You think, wow, there's a revival. Then Jesus said to those Jews who believed him, If you abide, continue to dwell in my word, you are my disciples indeed. Not just word, indeed. You shall know the truth, the truth that you walk in, and the truth shall make you free. Then they answered him, We are Abraham's descendants and have never been in bondage to anyone. How can you say you will be made free? Jesus answered them, Most assuredly I say to you, whoever commits sin is a slave of sin. What did Paul write in Galatians? That though we're children, we're nothing different than slaves until we become sons and daughters at the appointed time of the Father. Jesus is, in essence, telling the Jews, God's own chosen people, though they're Abraham's descendants, they're still slaves to sin. And they wanted to argue with him. A slave does not abide in the house forever, but a son abides forever. Therefore, if the son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. There it is. If the son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. I know that you are Abraham's descendants, but you seek to kill me because my word has no place in you. Wow. Being made free in Christ and through the word of God that we know and obey doesn't preclude us from being tempted or having to face trials. Anybody since you got saved faced temptations? Has anybody faced trials? Has anybody suffered loss? Wow. So being saved does not make us exempt from suffering in this world, does it? So since we're saved, We've got to have what to overcome this world? Faith. We see that this is the case in this story where Jesus is addressing the sin that is in the hearts of the Jews that they are obviously not cognizant of who had chosen to believe in him. Now get that. They've chosen to believe in him. That's a good thing. There's no doubt that Jesus is free since he is the word incarnate. There's no doubt about that, correct? But... He was still tempted, and in this story, he had to face opposition and even threats made against his life. Jesus tells us plainly what being made free means in verse 29. Let's look at it again. And he who sent me is with me. The Father has not left me alone, for I always do those things that please him. That is an indication that you are free. If you are free, you will always please the Father. Galatians chapter 5. Let's pick it up in verse 1. Stand fast, Paul writes, therefore in the liberty by which Christ has made us free and do not be entangled again with a yoke of bondage. Indeed, I, Paul, say to you that if any of you become circumcised, Christ will profit you nothing. And I testify again to every man who becomes circumcised that he is a debtor to keep the whole law. You have become estranged from Christ. You who attempt to be justified by the law, you have fallen from grace. Wow. For we through the Spirit eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. The Jews were not made righteous through circumcision. The circumcision was the outward expression of the inward heart being made righteous by faith. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything but faith working through love. By faith, the Jews in Galatia had been liberated from the yoke of bondage. It's possible to have faith in Christ like the Jews did there in John chapter 8 and believe in his teachings as being the truth but continue to be bound to a yoke of bondage. There's the problem. We have a lot of believers, but they're bound. This is why Paul tells us to stand steadfast in the liberty that Christ worked through to make us free. He was liberated. 
and through that liberty that he walked in, he has liberated us. Now we can be liberated to please God. Not works of the law, not the works of man, not have the fear of man, and not try to please man. We're free agents sent here from God, born of his spirit, independent, to serve God and please God only, and we're not in bondage to the flesh or anyone. The only way to be free and to live a liberated life is to do so through the power of faith. We love faith. As believers, we love it because we can receive anything. If you can believe it and ask for it, believe that you receive it, you shall have it, Jesus said. We love faith. Through faith, we've gotten homes, we've gotten families, we've seen barren women have babies in this church, we've seen spines straighten up, we've seen cancer go away, we've seen heart disease healed, we have seen mountains move, we've seen debts paid off here because of faith. By having faith and operating by faith are two different things. John teaches us in his epistle that it is our faith in Christ that gives us the victory over the world. That sounds good, but putting that into application is very hard for children. I'm not talking about little kids. I'm talking about people who will not mature in Christ. They stay childish. The Jews in Galatia believed, but they didn't know how to properly walk and live by faith. If they had of, if they had known, they would not have listened to the unbelieving Jews and place themselves in bondage again to the law of circumcision, which is exactly what Paul's addressing there in that chapter, is it not? They had faith, but they didn't know how to correctly apply faith. Why do so many believers today live under a yoke of bondage and remain to have sin dwelling in the hearts so that they cannot please God freely? Think about this, y'all. It's a real problem. Look at how many people add things to their salvation like the Jews were trying to do in Galatia. You've got to add circumcision to your faith or you're not going to make it. Paul says, that's not right. I submit to you on the basis of God's word that we've read out of Galatians chapter 5 and John chapter 8 and on the message that God has given me for you all tonight that it is due to the fact that not every believer understands or knows how to fully utilize faith given to them by the Lord. Every person, the Bible says in Romans 12, 3, has been given a measure of faith. And with a grain of mustard seed, faith, you can move mountains. So if we've been given a measure, it's larger than a seed of mustard. Either that, either people do not fully understand or know how to fully utilize faith that's been given to them by God. Either that, or they refuse, like the Jews in the wilderness, to exercise their faith. So we've got to find out where you're at. Do you not understand how to do it or you're not willing to do it? When we as believers fail to properly apply our faith to the circumstances, to the temptations and the trials of this life, this will result in us living in bondage. This is so liberating, y'all. When we do not or we will not correctly apply faith to our circumstances, temptations, trials in life, it will result in us living in bondage. And you will be miserable, frustrated, aggravated, irritated, and all the other aids. When we would seek to live for God and serve Him, we won't be liberated to step out in faith because we're not properly applying our faith. There's a reason to this. Hang on. This is a very real issue in the body of Christ in our generation. There are believers, untold number of believers, who have a willingness in their spirit, but their flesh is weak. And they stumble. Paul told the Galatia Jews there, he says, because you have believed what the unbelieving Jews have said to you, and you've gone back under the law, you have fallen from grace. When we don't know how to correctly apply the faith that God has given us to our circumstances, situations, and to adverse people that come against us, then our flesh will be weak, our spirit won't have the strength, and it will cause us to stumble. Meaning, people by the millions fall short or either 
give up too easily in their effort to exercise faith. We need to let that one soak for a moment. This is why people in our generation give up on walking in faith so easily. When the Jews met up with no water, they wanted to go back. When they didn't have food, they wanted to go back. They wanted to give up so easily, and it's no different today. People start getting challenged. They start having hardship. They start having problems, but they refuse or don't know how to apply their faith to that situation. It causes them to inevitably lose hope, and they want to turn back and give up too soon. If women were that way when they were pregnant, they'd never be able to give birth to that child. Every one of them would have to be taken. Amen or oh me. You got to push sometimes if you want something. Christ had set the Jews free who had believed on his name in Galatia, but they didn't continue in faith and ultimately fell back under the yoke of bondage to the law since the unbelieving Jews were able to persuade them that faith alone was not enough. See, that's why we've got to know who we are in Christ Jesus because if we don't know who we are in Christ Jesus and we're trying to figure out this walk called faith and people come along and see your liberty and they say, I don't like that liberty. It ain't got enough religion mixed to it. So they come and add bondage to you to want you to add works to that. You need to be doing this too. You can't just be free. All y'all want to be free, but y'all need to put a little works with that. So here, I'm going to add some of my bondage and you got to please me while you're pleasing God. That's nothing but man's religion and you get up under that, and you, when you get up under that, you start walking under spirit condemnation, and Christians who walk under spirit of condemnation will have a judgmental attitude. Yes. Amen. That was free. This is how works is introduced and becomes infused in our walk of faith with Christ and how our works become a part of our worship to the Lord. It boils down to this, y'all. If we don't know how to correctly walk by faith and apply it to our lives in every situation, we will forget who we are in the Spirit and resort to works to compensate when you don't know who you are in the Spirit because somebody has caused you to stumble and add works to your faith, you're going to try to compensate through works for how we feel since we feel like we have failed God or fallen short. Wow. you got to compensate. We do that all the time. Somebody insults us, we'll compensate. Well, you don't understand. Wait a minute. Who are you to tell me I don't measure up? Did you die on the cross for me? Amen or oh me? I mean, put people in their place, but do it with love. Just as the believing Jews in Galatia had their eyes on the unbelieving Jews, it's possible for us to place too much emphasis on how others are able to sway or influence our walk of faith since we aren't sure how we're supposed to do it in the first place. Unsteady in our faith. Shaken. Not having real confidence. Because people who don't step out in faith won't have the confidence when the faith is tested. So if you want the faith that works under pressure, you've got to step out in faith. People never step out of the boat. When the pressure comes, they won't have the faith to stand against the trial either. And they'll succumb to the pressure. That was good right there. If you know you're right about your stand of faith, why would you give an ear to someone who might tell you otherwise? That's what the Jews did. If they knew they were right, why would they give ear to those that would not believe in the same Jesus that they believed in? That tells us something was wrong with the way they perceived faith to operate. This is exactly what the believing Jews did. This is the subject that the Lord sent me here to address in this teaching on faith. Letting others cause you to be influenced so that you don't live and walk in the liberty that Christ has made us free by. Can't go there. Can't do it. How can two walk together except they be agreed? you got to have unity of the faith. Mark chapter 4. Mark 4, 35. On the same day when evening had come, he said to them, 
let us cross over to the other side. Now when they had left the multitude, they took him along in the boat as he was, and the other little boats were also with him. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves beat into the boat so that it was already filling. But he was in the stern, asleep on a pillow, and they awoke him. I wonder if that was a my pillow. <laughs> Just wonder. And they awoke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And he arose and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. And he said to them, Put away your toys. Why are you so fearful? And how is it that you have what? Nothing. Not a little. You have no faith. He'd been walking with them. He'd been doing miracles with them. He's done a lot of things to help them get kicked in where they operated by faith. And they got into a crisis situation and they had no faith. Here's why they had no faith in the crisis. They were not walking by faith when they walked with Jesus. How do you walk with Jesus and not walk in faith? There's religion under the guise of Christianity. And they feared him exceedingly because he called them on the carpet told them like it was, and said to one another, who can this be that even the wind, see they don't even know their identity, because they don't know the one in whom they are created in the image and likeness of, who can this be that even the wind and the sea obey him? Take note of the attitude and the lack of respect that the disciples used to address the Lord of heaven. Carest thou not that we're about to perish? Wake up. You don't care about us. They copped a two, didn't they? They spoke to him with contempt and tried to blame him for the peril they were facing in the boat. People who shirk responsibility blame others when they can't get their life right. They wanted to blame him for being in the peril that they were in and they copped an attitude with him. This is where a lot of believers in the church world are presently. When they face something that is bigger than they're willing to believe in God to bring them through, they allow their hearts to harden and begin to blame God, to blame the leaders of the church and others for their problems. Oh me or amen. Why is it so easy for modern day Christians to become offended and begin to cast dispersions upon God and others? They're doing it. It's epidemic. It's because they simply refuse to utilize their faith and speak to the storm themselves. Why didn't the disciples get up there and speak to the storm? Right? They didn't do it because they had no faith. That storm was bigger than their faith because they had no faith. So they blamed Jesus for being asleep and they're in peril because he won't speak to the storm on their behalf. And people cop an attitude with God all the time. God, why are you allowing this stuff to happen? And God says, whatever you bind on earth, I'll bind in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth, I'll loose in heaven. But we sit down here and say, but God, but God, but God. And God said, but you. The Lord has answered for us the cause or reason why so many hold on to offense against God and leaders in the church. It's because they refuse to stand against their storms, their storms, in their own faith. That right there was worth my drive. I'd come back for more of that. It's because they refuse to stand against their storms in their own faith. So they get offended at God and the church leadership because the church leadership or God failed them when it was their time to stand up in faith. And I am not God. I cannot be omnipresent. And I certainly cannot be there to help you in your unbelief. I am not an enabler. You want more? <laughs> when disciples of Christ in the modern day church refuse to operate by faith, and take authority over their own storms. They will want someone else to bail them out of their troubles. Thus, the introduction of the government. We're looking to the government to bail us out because we don't have the faith to speak to the storms ourselves. Jesus 
Look at the audacity they had toward Jesus. Do you not care? Jesus wasn't their whipping post. Pastors are not people's whipping post. But he came to teach his disciples how to have faith, utilize their faith, and through their faith, overcome this world by his example. If he can speak to the storm and it obeys him, and we speak in his name, it should obey us. Because it's not our tongue, it's his name on our tongue that gets the authority out there in the spirit. You will know that you're no longer a child or a babe in Christ and that God is maturing you to the point of becoming a mature son or daughter of God because God will allow you to begin to face more and more difficult trials that in the flesh could cause you to jump ship, but in the spirit you will overcome through faith. Why do you think the birth pangs are getting stronger and closer together? God says, my church that the gates of hell shall not prevail against, my church is about to get ready because I'm going to throw them one contraction after the other and they'll think, my God, are you trying to kill us? And God says, no, every time the enemy throws something at you, that weapon's not going to form, but you're going to get wisdom to overcome it. And when you overcome it, you will have the grace to never see that again. And everything that the enemy throws, that you, you'll become stronger, you'll become wiser, and you won't fall prey to enemy devices. And when you don't fall prey to enemy's devices, you will be able to take out the enemy. Don't think God has deserted us, that God has abandoned us. God says, I've turned you loose on Satan, and he don't know which way to go because you're coming after him. He's not coming after you. We got the shoe on the wrong foot. We think Satan's on the throne and it's Jesus is on the throne. Yeah. Satan's under the feet. Yeah. But if we don't stand on faith, Jesus rose up from his bed and spoke with authority over the storms that threatened our lives. Consequently, a calm came up on the atmosphere, came up on the disciples. Jesus came to teach them and every believer how to have and exercise faith, and to have and walk in spiritual authority over the powers of the enemy, not complain about them. So the next time you hear somebody complain about the church, say, where's your faith? Joshua 111, about to get real. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spoke to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore arise, go over this Jordan, you and all this people, to the land which I am giving to them, the children of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given you, as I said to Moses, from the wilderness and this Lebanon, as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all of the land of the Hittites and of the great sea toward the going down of the sun shall be your territory. And no man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you nor forsake you. Be strong and of good courage. For to this people you shall divide as an inheritance the land which I swore to the fathers to give them. Only be strong and very courageous that you may observe to do according to all the law which Moses my servant commanded. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left, that you may prosper wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. For then you shall make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. There's your key to success, y'all. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and of good courage. Do not be afraid. Do not be dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Sometimes, every once in a while, in order to call servants like Joshua, like Caleb, to rise to the place of taking responsibility and become the leaders of tomorrow, God has to remove the leaders of yesterday from them. 
at some point in the body of Christ, in our generation, Christians are going to have to grow up and take ownership of their position in Christ if they truly want to be free and liberated to serve God. Fulfill their calling. Three times in these short nine verses, the Lord had to tell and reiterate to Joshua, the servant of Moses, to be strong and of good courage. He's walking in the shadow of Moses all those years. And now Moses is gone, and there's nobody between him and God but air. And now it's his time to shine. And he's like, huh, not me. That's what happens when you put too much faith in someone else. When they're gone, you go into a fetal position because you don't know the God that they knew. Joshua was reluctant, or he did what so many in the body of Christ do today, and he drew back instead of stepping up when God instructed him to step forward, take responsibility for himself, and not blame God or others for his unwillingness to use his faith. Hmm. Boy, that's sobering. God says, it's you. I've taken away all your excuses. You blamed them long enough. I took them out of your life. Now it's your time. Are you going to walk by faith? Or are you going to live in bondage the rest of your life? Jeremiah chapter 1. Verse 4. Then the word of the Lord came to me saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified, set you apart. I ordained you a prophet to the nations. Then said I, this is Jeremiah's response to what God has told him about being a prophet to the nations. Ah, oh, Lord God, behold, I cannot speak, for I am a youth. Is he using faith? Did faith come by hearing and hearing by the word of God? No. Who is he placing emphasis on? God or himself? On his belief or God's word? See how easy that is? God, I can't do this. You don't know who you talk to. You don't know who you pick. It's me. Nobody cares about me. Nobody looks at me. Nobody gives me the time of day. I am so insignificant they don't even remember I'm on the bus. And you want me to do what? You don't know who you're talking to up in here. But the Lord said to me, Do not say that I am a youth. That's unbelief. For you shall... Was it a fact? That's what happens when facts meets faith. God changed the facts to conform to the truth. For you shall go to all to whom I send, to you, send you, and whatever I command you, you shall speak. And do not be afraid of their faces, for I am with you to deliver you, says the Lord. Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth, and the Lord said to me, Behold, I have put my words in your mouth. See this day. It was God who sent him over the nations, and over the kingdoms. God did that. The Lord is telling me to tell this generation of Christians that it's time to grow up. It's time to take responsibility and step into the position that God has appointed for you to fill. We can no longer tell God and others why we can't or offense will come. Is offense a big tool of the enemy right now? Not only in the church, but in this nation. Have you ever seen so many people in one nation have so much to be offended about? Do you see that offense being spread in other nations? Do you really hear about all that? You're to this, you're to that. And I'm offended that you're not the same color I am. That's offense, y'all. Where is the offense coming from? Why is offense so prevalent in the last days? Because people are not willing, though they call themselves Christ-like, they're not willing to exercise their faith, so they blame everybody else for why they're a victim. It's up to you to take the reins or stay where you are and blame God and others for your problems. God has given you the faith to face the Goliaths in your world. Complaining won't take them out. Only faith will destroy the giants in the land. Does this generation need this word? There's giants in the land. And the Davids, the Esthers, the Ruths, the Joshua and the Calebs are 
hiding out in caves for fear of man. Because they either will not or do not know how to apply their faith because they have not yet stepped out. And if you don't step out like David did, you won't be able to face your Goliath. Being able to have confidence in God, to step out from the crowd and serve God by your own faith is the line of demarcation, the line of separation between living as a slave or living free, between being who God called you to be or living according to the whims of others. It will distinguish believers between being babes in Christ or becoming the mature sons and daughters of God in Christ. Matthew 15, we're done. For the first time in 11 years that I can remember having the privilege of being on television, we're getting a lot of calls from people. The calls that come in shows us our demographics, meaning that's our audience. The audience that this ministry reaches through television and internet is predominantly 40 years and older. The message that God has given me is not connecting to this generation, though this generation needs it more than the older generation. So something has to happen heart of the younger generation to want the words of Moses. I'm not Moses. I'm just relating you to that. Matthew 15, verse 21. Then Jesus went out from there, and he departed to the region of Tyre and Sidon. And behold, a woman of Canaan came from the region and cried out to him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely demon-possessed, and because she is a Syrophoenician or Greek woman, she is a Gentile and outside the covenant. But he answered her not a word. Can you imagine that? She's pleading to the Lord to have mercy that her daughter may be delivered from this severe demon possession that's going on in her daughter's life, and Jesus doesn't even answer her a word, y'all. How would you like to go to that church? I need you. Silence. My daughter's dying. Nothing. How would you respond to that and his disciples if that were not bad enough came and urged him saying send her away for she cries out after us and he answered and said I was not sent except to the lost sheep of the house of Israel they just piling it on her then she came and worshipped him who does that they've given her every reason to be offended and she comes and worships the Lord, y'all. Who does that? I want to meet him. Lord, help me. But he answered and said, It is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the little dogs. Now nah, he's calling her a dog. And she said, Yes, Lord, yet even the little dogs eat the crumbs which fall from their master's table. She recognized the authority on his life. What did the Roman centurion say? My servant is lying ill at the point of death. You are a man under authority and you're a man of authority. I'm a man under authority and I'm a man of authority. That centurion soldier, a Gentile, got what he wanted from Jesus, though he was a Gentile, because he recognized and acknowledged and submitted to the authority. And that's what babes in Christ refused to submit to. Authority. Then Jesus answered and said to her, O woman, great is your faith. Of the two people that Jesus says that in the Bible to, both are Gentiles. Great is your faith. I have not seen such faith in all of Israel, he says in another account. And her daughter was healed from that very hour. She could have taken offense, walked out, and watched her daughter die of demon possession, but she refused because there was something inside of her that said, this is the Son of God. I will honor his authority no matter how much he belittles me because I'm not here for my feelings. I'm here for my healing. I'm passionate about this because I hate the spirit of religion. It crucified Jesus. It wasn't sinners. 
It was the religious world that nailed Jesus to that cross. Evil. They'll tie our church up. They'll get people so offended, tore up from the floor up, while those people are here trying to get their children off drugs, trying to get their children out of homosexual marriages and relationships. They're here to get saved, and the, the religious spirits come in like wolves and start saying, you shouldn't listen to him, he's angry. And they walked away offended. She was given every opportunity to get offended and to walk away. But she had a need that only Jesus could feel. Aha! There's the value of your salvation. Where else shall we go? Only you have the words of eternal life. You've got to value your salvation. You've got to value your faith in Jesus, and it doesn't matter who comes up against you. I don't care what title they want behind their name. If they contradict your faith in Jesus Christ, tell them to get lost. Amen. Could it be that this generation can walk away from their faith and the Lord so easily because they don't know who they are in Christ since they haven't fully placed their faith in him to step out. Yeah. Satan has used feelings to rob this generation of their spiritual identity, their spiritual authority and liberty that they have in Christ by exploiting people's feelings. Amen. They call it the snowflake generation. Yeah. I didn't call them that. I said they call them. The world calls them the snowflake generation because it's all about feelings. But what I want to know is, what's the spiritual aspect to why they are bound by their feelings? If a believer doesn't train themselves to live and respond by faith, feelings will get hurt and forward progress will be halted. And that's where we're at. This undeserving Gentile woman got her miracle by faith, y'all. That's what fuels my fire. That's what causes me to get more intense and more passionate the more under fire I am. You dumb. No, I'm blind to the natural. I'm not dumb. I am locked in. I'm honed in. I got my laser locked on what God said. This generation will take over the kingdoms of this world through their faith. That's the only way it's going to happen. 1 Corinthians 13, 11. When I was a child, Paul wrote, I spoke as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child, but when I became a man, when I became grown up in the faith, I put away my toys. Father, thank you so much for the liberating power that's on this word to set those that believe on you but are still in, under the yoke of bondage. Thank you that you have broken it down for us very plainly, very simply, so that we can digest it in our spirit and receive that liberty so that we do not give place to the spirit of offense because you said offenses shall come. It's unavoidable, you said in so many words. But you came to prepare us by our example on how to overcome offense, and that's through our faith. When you live by faith, when you walk by faith, you don't have time for offense. Faith that works through love, now there's your victory. It won't give place to offense.